All right, today I want to talk about uh, um, a bit more about fault tolerance and replication, and then uh, look into the details of today's paper about VMware FT. Um, the topic is still fault tolerance to provide high availability. That is, uh, you want to build a server that even if some hardware, you know, computer crashes is involved in the service, we still like to provide the service. Um, and to the extent we can, we'd like to provide our service also if there's network problems. And the tool we're using is replication, at least for this part of the course. Um, so it's worth asking what kind of failures replication can be expected to deal with. Um, because it's not everything by any means. Um, so maybe the easiest way to characterize the kind of failures we're talking about is fail-stop failures um, of a single computer. And what I mean by fail-stop, it's a sort of generic term um, in fault tolerance, is that if something goes wrong with, say, the computer, the computer simply stops executing. Um, it just stops if anything goes wrong. And in particular, it doesn't compute incorrect results. So if somebody kicks the power cable out of your um, server, that's probably going to generate a fail-stop failure. Similarly, if they um, unplug your server's network connection, even though the server's still running, so it's just a little bit funny, you know, it'll be totally cut off from the network. So it looks from the outside like it just stopped. So it's really these failures we can deal with, with replication. Um, this also covers some hardware problems, like, you know, maybe if the fan on your server breaks because it you know, only costs 50 cents, maybe that'll cause the CPU to overheat, and the CPU will shut itself down cleanly um, and just stop executing. Um, what's not covered by the kind of replication systems we're talking about um, is things like bugs in software or design defects in hardware. So basically not bugs. Because if we take some service, you know, say your MapReduce master, for example, and, you know, we replicate it and run it on two computers. You know, if there's a bug in your MapReduce master, or my MapReduce master, let's say, um, replication's not going to help us. We're going to compute the same incorrect result on both of our copies of our uh, MapReduce master and Everything will look fine, they'll agree. It'll just happen to be the wrong answer. So we can't defend against bugs in the replicated software. And we can't defend against bugs in the whatever scheme we're using to manage the replication. Um, and similarly, as I mentioned before, we can't expect to um, deal with bugs in the hardware. If the hardware computes incorrectly, that's just, that's the end for us, um, at least with this kind of technique. Um, Although, you know, that said, there are definitely hardware and software bugs that, that replication might, if we're lucky, might be able to cope with. So if there's some unrelated software running in your server and it causes the server to crash, maybe causes your kernel to panic and reboot for something that has nothing to do with, you know, with, your, with the service you're replicating, then that kind of failure for, our, for your service will, may well be fail-stop. Uh, um, you know, the kernel will panic, and the backup replica will take over. Um, similarly, some kinds of hardware errors can be turned into fail-stop errors. For example, um, if you send a packet over the network and the network corrupts, it just flips a bit in your packet, that will almost certainly be caught by the checksum on the packet. Same thing for a disk block. If you write some data to disk and read it back a month later, you know, maybe the magnetic surface isn't perfect and, you know, one of the bits, a couple of bits were wrong in the block as it's read back. There's actually error correcting code that up to a certain point will fix errors in disk blocks that you be turning, you know, random hardware errors into as either correcting them um, if you're super lucky or det at least detecting them and turning random corruption into a detected fault, which, you know, the software then knows that something went wrong and can turn it into a fail-stop fault by stopping executing or take some other remedial action. Um, but in general, um, we really can only expect to handle uh, fail-stop faults. Um, 
there's other limits to replication too. You know, the, um, the failures in the, if we have a primary and a backup or two replicas or whatever, we're really assuming that failures in the two are independent, right? If they tend to have correlated failures, then replication is not going to help us. So, for example, if we're a big outfit and we buy thousands of computers, batches of thousands of computers, identical computers from the same manufacturer, and we run, you know, our replicas on all on those computers we bought at the same time from the same place, that's a bit of a risk, maybe, um, because. You know, presumably, if one of them has a manufacturing defect in it, there's a good chance that the other ones do too. Um, you know, one of them's prone to overheating because the manufacturer, you know, didn't provide enough airflow. Well, they probably all have that problem, and so one of them overheats and dies. Ah, there's a good chance that the other ones will too. Um, so that's one kind of correlated failure you just have to be careful of. Another one is that you know, if there's an earthquake in the city where our data center is, it's probably going to take out the whole data center. You know, we can have all the replication we like inside that data center. It's not going to help us because the failure caused by an earthquake or a citywide power failure or something, or the building burning down is like it's a correlated failure between our replicas if they're all in that building. So if we care about dealing with earthquakes, then we need to put our replicas in maybe in dif different cities, at least physically separate enough that they have separate power, unlikely to be affected by the same natural disaster. Um, Okay, but that's all sort of hovering in the background for this discussion where we're um, talking about the technology you might use. Another question about replication is whether it's worthwhile. You may ask yourself, gosh, you know, this literally uses, these replication schemes use twice as much or three times as much computer resources, right? We need to have, you know, GFS had three copies of every block, so we have to buy three times as much disk space. The paper for today, you know, replicates just once, but that means we have twice as many computers and CPUs and RAM. It's all very expensive. Like, is that really worth it, that expense? Um, and, you know, that's not something we can answer technically, right? It's an economic question. It depends on the value of having an available service. You know, if you're running a bank and if the consequences of the computer failing is that your customer, you can't serve your customers and you can't generate revenue and your customers all hate you, then it may well be worth it to blow you know, an extra 10 or 20,000 bucks on a second computer so you can have a replica. Um, on the other hand, if you're me and you're running the 6824 web server, um, I don't consider it worthwhile to have a hot backup of the 824 web server because the consequences of failure um, are very low. So you know, the, whether the replication is worthwhile and how many replicas you ought to have um, and how much you're willing to spend on it is all about how much cost and inconvenience um, failure would call you, cause you. Right, this paper sort of in the beginning um, mentions that there's a couple of different approaches to replication. Um, really mentions two, one that calls state transfer. And the other calls replicated state machine. Now, most of the schemes we're going to talk about in this class are replicated state machines. Um, but I'll talk about both anyway. The idea behind state transfer is that if we have two, uh, replicas of a server, um, the way you cause them to be to stay in sync, that is to be tr actual replicas, so that the backup can has everything it needs to take over if the primary fails, in a state transfer scheme, the way that works is that the primary sends a copy of its entire state, that is, for example, the contents of its RAM, to the backup. And the backup just sort of stores the latest state, and so it's all there if the primary fails, and the backup can start executing um, with the last state it got if the primary fails. So this is all about sending the state of the, of the primary. And for today's, if today's paper worked as a state transfer system, which it doesn't, then the state we'd be talking about would be the contents of the RAM, the contents of the memory um, of the primary. So maybe every once in a while the primary would just, you know, make a big copy of its memory and send it across the network to the backup. And you can imagine if you wanted to be efficient, you know, maybe you would only send the parts of the memory that it's changed since the last time you sent memory to the backup. Um, the replicated state machine, uh, this approach observes that most services or most computer things we want to replicate have some 
internal operation um, that's deterministic except when external input comes in. Right, you know, ordinarily, if, if there's no external influences on a computer, it just executes one instruction after another. And what each instruction does is a deterministic function of what's in the memory and the registers of the computer. And it's only when external events intervene that something unexpected may happen, like a packet arrives at a, some random time, um, and that causes the uh, server to start doing something differently. Um, so replicated state machine schemes don't send the state between the replicas, instead they just send those external events. They just send, um, a, maybe from a primary to a backup again, just send things like arriving input from the outside world that the backup needs to know about. Um, and the observation is that you know, if you have two, two computers and they start from the same state and they see the same inputs um, that, that they're in the same order or at the same time, the two computers will continue to be replicas of each other and sort of execute identically, as long as they both see the same inputs at the same time. Um, so this transfers probably memory, um, and this transfers from primary backup just operations from clients or external, external inputs or external events. Um, and you know, the reason why people tend to favor replicated state machine is that usually operations are smaller than the state. But this, you know, the state of a server, if it's a database server, might be the entire database, might be you know, gigabytes, whereas the operations are just some client sending, you know, please read or write key 27. Operations are usually small, the state's usually large, so replicated state machine usually looks attractive. And the slight downside is that the schemes tend to be um, quite a bit more complicated and rely on sort of more assumptions um, about how the computers operate. Whereas this is a really heavy handed, I'm just gonna send you my whole state, it's really nothing to worry about. Any questions about these strategies? Yes? I mean, specifically for the use case of the MS, like what's the biggest disaster that can happen when the state goes out of sync? Well, uh, the, the, okay, so the question is, Suppose something went wrong with our scheme and the backup was not actually identical to the primary. Um, so, you know, you know, supposing we're running a GFS master and it's the primary had just handed out a lease to chunk server one, um, but because the two, you know, because we've allowed the states of the primary and the backup to drift out of sync, the backup did not issue a lease to anybody. It wasn't even aware anybody had asked for a lease. So now the primary thinks, you know, chunk server one has a lease for some chunk and the backup doesn't. The primary fails. Backup takes over, right? Now chunk server one thinks it has a lease for some chunk, but then the current master doesn't and is happy to hand out the lease to some other chunk server. And now we have two chunk servers serving the same lease, right? So that's just a close to home example, but really, you know, almost any bad thing kind of, I can you construct any bad scenario by just imagining some service that computes the wrong answer because the states diverge. Um, yes? So you're asking about randomization. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this to, I'll talk about this a bit later on, but you know, it is a good, the, the replicated state scheme definitely um, makes the most sense when the instructions that the primary and the backup are executing do the same thing as long as there's no external events, right? And that's almost true, right? You know, for an add instruction or something. Yeah, you know, if the starting, if the registers of memory are the same and they both execute an add instruction, the add instruction is gonna have the same inputs and the same outputs. But there are some instructions, as you point out, that don't, like maybe there's an instruction that gets the current time of day now probably be executed at slightly different times, or an instruction that gets the current processor's unique ID, you know, serial number. It's gonna yield at different answers. And the, the, um, the uniform answer to questions that sound like this is that the primary does it and sends the answer to the backup. And the backup does not execute that instruction, but instead at the point where it would execute that instruction, it listens for the primary to tell it what the right answer would be and just sort of fakes that answer. Um, to the software. I'll talk about 
you know, how the VMware scheme does that. Okay. Um, interestingly enough, though today's paper um, is all about a replicated state machine, you may have noticed that today's paper only deals with uniprocessors, and it's not that clear how it could be extended to a multi-core um, multi machine where the interleavings of the instructions from the two cores are, are non-deterministic. Right? So we no longer have this situation on a multi-core machine where if we just let the primary and backup execute, they're, you know, all else being equal, they're going to be the same, because they won't um, if they're executed on multiple cores. VMware has since come out with a new, possibly completely different, um, replication system that does work on multi-core, and the new system appears to me to be using state transfer instead of replicated state machine because state transfer is more robust in the face of uh, multi-core and parallelism. Um, if you freeze the machine and send the memory over, you know, that the memory image is just, that just is the state of the machine and sort of it doesn't matter that there was parallelism, whereas the replicated state machine scheme really has a problem with, with parallelism. Um, you know, on the other hand, I'm guessing that this new multi-core scheme is more expensive. Okay. All right, so um, if we want to build a replicated state machine scheme, we got a, a number of questions to answer. Um, so we need to decide at what level we're going to replicate state, right? So what state, what do we mean um, by state? Um, we have to worry about how how closely synchronized the primary and backup have to be, right? Because it's likely the primary will execute a little bit ahead of the backup. After all, it's the primary that sees the inputs. Um, so the backup almost necessarily must lag. But that, gives it, that means there's an opportunity if the primary fails for the, prim for the backup not to be fully caught up. Um, having the backup actually execute really in lockstep with the primary is very expensive because it requires a lot of chit chat. So a lot of designs, a lot of what people sweat about is um, how close the synchronization is. So, um, if the primary fails, or you know, actually if the backup fails too, but it's more exciting if the primary fails, there has to be some scheme for switching over and the clients have to know um, oh gosh, I should, instead of talking to the old primary on server one, I should now be talking to um, the, uh, the backup on server two. So all the clients have to somehow figure this out. Um, the switchover almost certainly, it's almost impossible, maybe impossible, to design a cutover system in which no anomalies are ever, are ever visible. You know, in this sort of ideal world, if the primary fails, we'd like nobody to ever notice, none of the clients to notice. Turns out that's um, basically unattainable. So there's gonna be anomalies during the cutover and we've gotta figure out a way to cope with them. Um, and finally, if, the, if one of the two, if one of our replicas fails, we really need to have a new replica, right? If, if we have a, two replicas and one fails, we're just living on borrowed time, right? Because the second replica may fail at some point. So we absolutely need to get a new replica back online as fast as possible. Um, so, and, and that can be very expensive. The state is big, you know. You know, the reason we liked replicated state machine was because we thought state transfer would be expensive. But the two replicas in a replicated state machine still need to have full state, right? We just had a cheap way of keeping them both in sync. If we need to create a new replica, we actually have no choice but state transfer to create the new replica. The new replica needs to have a complete copy of the state. Um, so it's gonna be expensive to create new replicas and um, this is often people spend, well actually people spend a lot of time worrying about all these questions. And we'll, you know, we'll see them again as we look at other uh, replicated state machine schemes. Um, so, on the topic of what state to replicate, the, today's paper has a very interesting answer to this question. It replicates the full state of the machine, that is, all of memory and all the machine registers. Um, it's like a very, very detailed replication scheme. Um, just no difference, at the, even at the lowest levels, between the primary and the backup. That's quite rare for uh, replication schemes. Um, 
almost always you see something that's more like GFS, where GFS absolutely did not replicate, um, you know, it had replication, but it wasn't replicating every single, you know, bit of memory between the primaries and the backups. It was replicating much more application level um, table of chunks. Right? It had this abstraction of, you know, chunks and chunk identifiers, and that's what it was replicating. It wasn't replicating sort of everything else. It wasn't going to the expense of replicating every single other thing the machines were doing. It's okay as long as um, they have the same sort of application visible set of, uh, of chunks. Um, so most replication schemes out there go the GFS route. In fact, almost everything except pretty much this paper and a few handful of similar systems. Almost everything uses application, but some level application uh, level of replication because it can be much more efficient uh, because we don't have to go to the, we don't have to go to the trouble of, for example, making sure that interrupts occur at exactly the same point in the execution of the primary and backup. GFS does not sweat that at all, but this paper has to because um, it replicates at such a low level. So most people um, build efficient systems with application specific replication. The consequence of that, though, is that the replication has to be built into the, re into the application, right? If you're getting a feed of, applica of application level operations, for example, you really need to have the application participate in that because some generic replication thing like today's paper doesn't really, can't understand um, the, the semantics of what needs to be replicated. So, so anyway, so most teams are application specific like GFS and every other paper we're going to read on this topic. Um, today's paper is unique in that it replicates at the level of the machine and therefore does not care what software you run on it. Right? It replicates the low level memory and machine registers. You can run any software you like on it and as long as it runs on that kind of microprocessor that's being repli that um, this replication scheme applies to, the software can be anything. Um, and you know, the downside is that it's um, not that efficient necessarily. The upside is that you can take any existing piece of software. Maybe you don't even have source code for it or understand how it works. Um, and you know, to within some limits, you can just run it under this under VMware's replication scheme, and it'll just work. Um, which is a sort of magic fault tolerance wand for arbitrary software. All right. Now let me talk about. Um, how this is VMware FT works. Um, first of all, VMware is a virtual machine company. They're, what their, their business is, um, a lot of their business is selling virtual machine technology. And what virtual machines refer to is um, the idea of, you know, you buy a single computer, and um, instead of booting an operating system like Linux on the hardware, you boot what we'll call a virtual machine monitor or hypervisor on the hardware. And the hypervisor's job is actually to simulate multiple, um, multiple computers, multiple virtual computers on this piece of hardware. So the virtual machine monitor may boot up, you know, one instance of Linux, or maybe multiple instances of Linux, maybe a Windows uh, machine. You can, the virtual machine monitor on this one computer can run a bunch of different uh, operating systems you know, and each of these is, a, is itself um, some sort of operating system kernel and then applications. So this is the technology they're starting with. Um, and, you know, the reason for this is that if, you know, you need to, it just turns out there's many, many reasons why it's very convenient to kind of interpose this level of interaction between the hardware and operating systems. It means that we can buy one computer and run lots of different operating systems on it. Um, we can have each, if we run lots and lots of little services, instead of having to have lots and lots of computers, one per service, you can just buy one computer and run each service in the operating system that it needs um, using these virtual machines. So this was their starting point. They already had this stuff and a lot of sophisticated things built around it um, at the start of designing VMware FT. So this is just virtual machines. Um, what the paper's doing is that um, it's going to set up one machine, or, well, it, it requires two physical machines because there's no, 
point in running the primary and backup software in different virtual machines on the same physical machine because we're trying to guard against hardware failures. Um, so you can have two, at least, you know, you can have two machines running um, their virtual machine monitors. Um, and the primary is going to run on one, and the backup's in the other. So on one of these machines, we have um, a guest. You know, we only, it might be running a lot of virtual machines. We only care about one of them. Uh, it's going to be running some guest operating system and some sort of server application, maybe a database server or MapReduce master or something. Um, so I'll call this the primary. And there'll be a second machine that you know, runs the same virtual machine monitor um, and an identical virtual machine holding the backup. So we have the same, whatever the operating system is, exactly the same. Um, and the virtual machine is you know, giving these guest operating systems, the primary and backup, uh, each a range of memory. And these memory images will be identical, or you know, the goal is to make them identical in the, in the primary and the backup. All right, we have two physical machines, each one of them running a uh, um, virtual machine guest with a, its own copy of the service we care about. We're assuming that there's a network um, connecting these two machines. And in addition on this, I'll call it a local area network, in addition on this network, there's some set of clients. Really, they don't have to be clients. They're just maybe other computers that um, our replicated service needs to talk with. Some of them are clients that are sending it requests. It turns out in this paper, um, uh, the replicated service actually doesn't use a local disk and instead assumes that there's um, some sort of disk server that it talks to. And um, although it's a little bit hard to realize this from the paper, um, the scheme actually does not really treat the disk server particularly uh, specially. It's just another external source of packets and place that the um, replicated state machine may send packets to. Not very much different from clients. Um, OK, so the basic scheme is that the, um, we assume that these two replicas, the two virtual machines, primary and backup, are, uh, are exact replicas. Some client, you know, database client, who knows what, some client of our replicated server sends a request to the primary. And that really takes the form of, of a network packet. That's what we're talking about. That generates an interrupt. And this interrupt actually goes to the virtual machine monitor, at least in the first instance. Um, the virtual machine monitor sees, aha, here's the input for this replicated uh, service. And so the virtual machine monitor does two things. One is it sort of simulates a network packet arrival interrupt um, into the primary guest operating system to deliver it. Um, to the primary copy of the application. And in addition, the virtual machine monitor you know, knows that this is an input to a replicated virtual machine. And it, so it sends back out on the network a copy of that packet um, to the backup virtual machine monitor. It also gets the, and the uh, backup virtual machine monitor knows, aha, this is a packet for this particular replicated state machine. And it also uh, fakes a sort of network packet arrival interrupt at the backup and delivers the packet. So now both uh, the primary and the backup have a copy of this packet. They both have the same input. You know, with a lot of details, they're going to process it in the same way um, and stay synchronized. Um, of course, the service is probably going to reply to the client. On the primary, the um, service will generate a reply packet and send it on the NIC that the virtual machine monitor is emulating. Um, and then the virtual machine monitor will, will see that output packet. And on the primary, they'll actually send the reply back out on the network to the client. Because the backup is running exactly the same sequence of instructions, it also generates a reply packet back to the client and sends that reply packet on its emulated NIC. Um, it's the virtual machine monitor that's emulating that network interface card. And it says, aha. You know, the virtual machine monitor says, I know this was the backup. Only the primary is allowed to generate output. And um, the virtual machine monitor drops the reply packet. So both of them see inputs, and only the primary generates outputs. Um, as far as terminology goes, the 
paper calls this stream of, um, of input events and other things, other events we'll talk about from the stream is called um, the logging channel. It all goes over the same network, presumably, but um, these events, the primary sense of the backup, are called uh, log events on the log channel. Um, where the fault tolerance comes in is that, um, so is the primary crashes. What the backup is going to see is that it stops getting stuff on the, uh, stops getting log entries. Must be log entries. Stops getting log entries on the logging channel, um, and we know, you know, it, it turns out that the backup can expect to get many per second because one of the things that generates log entries is periodic timer interrupts in the um, in the primary. Each one of which turns out every interrupt generates a log entry sent to the backup. These timer interrupts are going to happen like 100 times a second, so the backup can certainly expect to see you know, a lot of chit chat on the uh, logging channel if the primary's up. If the primary crashes, then the virtual machine monitor over here will say, gosh, you know, I haven't received anything on the logging channel for like a second or however long. The primary must be dead or, or something. Um, and in that case, um, when the backup stops seeing uh, log entries from the primary, the paper, the way the paper phrases it is that the backup goes live. And what that means is that it stops waiting for these input um, events on the logging channel from the primary. Um, and instead, it, the, this virtual machine monitor just lets this backup execute freely uh, without waiting for, without being driven by input events from the primary. The uh, VMM does something to the network to cause future client requests to go to the backup instead of the primary. And the uh, VMM here stops discarding um, the backup. Of course, now it's the primary, not the backup. Stops discarding output from this virtual machine. So now this virtual machine directly gets the inputs and is allowed to produce output. Um, and now our backup is taken over. And similarly, you know, if the, this is less interesting, but has to work correctly. If the backup fails, a similar the primary has to use a similar process to abandon the backup, stop sending in advance. Um, and just sort of act much more like a single non-replicated server. So either one of them can go live if the other one appears to be dead, stops, you know, stops generating network traffic. Yes? Um, when the backup goes live, how does future client requests know to go to the backup? Magic. No. Um, it depends, you know, it depends on what the networking te technology is. Um, uh, I think what the paper, one possibility is that this is sitting on Ethernet. Every physical computer on the Ethernet, or really every NIC, has a 48-bit you know, unique ID. Um, um, I'm making this up now. The, uh, um, it could be that, in fact, instead of each physical computer having a unique ID, each virtual machine does. And um, when the backup takes over, it essentially claims the primary's Ethernet ID as its own. And it starts saying, you know, I'm the owner of that ID, and then other people on the Ethernet will start sending us packets. Um, that's my interpretation of, of what they're up to. Yeah? How does this uh, whole mechanism deal with inherent sources and non-determinism? The, the um, uh, um, the, the designers, believe they had identified all such sources. <laughs> and for each one of them, the primary does whatever it is, you know, executes the random number generator instruction or takes an interrupt at some time. The backup does not. Um, and the backup virtual machine monitor sort of detects any such instruction and, and intercepts it and doesn't do it. And instead, the backup waits for an event on the logging channel saying, uh, this instruction number, you know, the random number was whatever it was on the primary. At which? At the level of like sampling the PSC. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the paper hints that they got Intel to add features to the microprocessor to support exactly this. <laughs> 
but they don't say what it was. Okay. Um, okay, so on that topic, the, um, so far the, you know, the story is sort of assumed that um, uh, as long as the backup just sees the packets from the clients, it'll execute in uh, identically to the, the primary. And that's actually uh, glossing over some huge um, and important details. So um, one problem is that, as a couple of people have mentioned, there are some things that are non-deterministic. Now, it's not the case that every single thing that happens in the computer is a deterministic function of the contents of the memory of the computer. Um, it is for sort of straight line code execution often, but certainly not always. So what we're worried about is things that may happen that are not a strict function of the current state. That is, that might be different if we're not careful on the primary and backup. So these are sort of non-deterministic events um, that may happen. So the designers had to sit down and like figure out what they all were. Um, and here are the ones... Um, Here's the kind of stuff they talk about. So one is inputs from external sources like clients, which arrive just whenever they arrive, right? They're not predictable. There are no sense in which the time at which a client request arrives or its content is a deterministic function of the service's state, because it's not. Um, so these actually, um, this system is really dedicated to a world in which services only talk over the network. And so the only, really, basically the only form of input or output in this system that is supported by this system seems to be network packets uh, coming and going. So when input arrives, what that really means is the packet arrives. Um, and what a packet really consists of for us is the data in the packet um, plus the interrupt that signaled um, that the packet had arrived. So that's quite important. So when a packet arrives, um, ordinarily, the NIC DMAs the packet contents into memory and then um, uh, raises an interrupt, which the operating system feels. And the interrupt happens at some point in the instruction stream. Um, and so both of those have to look identical on the primary and backup, or else we're going to have, or else our execution is going to diverge. And so, you know, the real issue is when the interrupt occurs, exactly at which instruction the interrupt happened to occur. It better be the same on the primary and the backup, otherwise their execution's different and their states are going to diverge. Um, so we care about the content of the packet and the timing of the interrupt. Um, and then as a couple of people have mentioned, there's a few um, instructions that... Um, that behave differently on different computers or differently depending on something, like there's maybe a random number generator instruction, there's like get time of day instructions that will yield different answers if called at different times, um, and unique ID instructions. Um, another huge source of non-determinism, which the paper basically rules out, is uh, multicore parallelism. Right? This is a uniprocessor-only system. There's no multicore in this world. The reason for this is that if it allowed multicore, then the, then the service would be running on multiple cores, and the instructions of the service that are executed in the different cores are interleaved in some way which is not predictable. And so, really, if we run the same code on the, on the backup and the server, if it's parallel code running on a multicore, the two will interleave the instructions in the two cores in different ways. The hardware will. And that can just cause different results um, because, you know, supposing the code on the two cores, you know, they both ask for a lock on some data. Well, on the master, you know, core one may get the lock before core two. On the slave, just because of a tiny timing difference, core two may get the lock first and the, you know, execution results are totally different, likely to be totally different if different threads get the lock. Um, so, Multicore is a grim source of non-determinism and is just totally outlawed in this paper's world. Um, and indeed, like, as far as I can tell, the techniques are not really applicable to multicore. Uh, would you be okay if instead of distributing over multicores, you just you distributed over different virtual machines and had 
Or like, can, is there ways to handle parallelism with virtual, like with this setup, or is it the whole all parallelism? The service can't use multi-core parallel, parallelism. The hardware is almost certainly multi-core parallel, but that's the hardware sitting underneath the virtual machine monitor. The machine that the virtual machine monitor exposes to one of the guest operating systems that runs the primary backup, that emulated virtual machine is a, unicor is a uniprocessor machine in this paper. And I'm, I'm guessing there's not an easy way for them to adapt this design to uh, multi-core virtual machines. Okay, so, um, so, so these are really, it's, it's, it's these events that go over the logging channel. Um, and so the format of a, um, of a log record, a log, a log entry, um, they don't quite say, but I'm guessing that there's really three things in a log entry. There's the instruction number at which the event occurred, because if you're delivering an interrupt or you know, input or whatever, it better be delivered at exactly the same place in the primary and backup. So we need to know the instruction number. And by instruction number, I mean you know, the number of instructions since the machine booted. Right, not the instruction address, but like, oh, we're executing the 4 billionth and 79th instruction since boot. Um, so log entry is going to have an instruction number. Um, for an interrupt, for input, it's going to be the instruction at which the interrupt was delivered on the primary. And for a weird instruction, like get, get time of day, it's going to be the instruction number of the instruction of the get time of day or whatever instruction that was executed on the primary. Um, so, the, you know, so the backup knows where to, um, where to cause this event to occur. Okay, so um, there's gonna be a type, you know, network input, whatever weird instruction, and then there's um, gonna be data. Um, for a packet arrival, it's gonna be the packet data. For one of these weird instructions, it's gonna be the result of the instruction when it was executed on the primary, so that the backup uh, virtual machine can sort of fake the instruction and supply that same result. Okay, so, um, so as an example, the, uh, both of these, um, the operating systems, guest operating system uh, assumes, requires that the hardware, in this case emulated hardware, virtual machine, has a timer that ticks, say, 100 times a second causes interrupts um, to the operating system. And that's how the operating system keeps track of time, is by counting these timer interrupts. Um, so the way that plays out here, and so the timer interrupts, by the way, have to happen at exactly the same place in the primary and backup, otherwise they don't execute the same and they'll diverge. Um, so what really happens is that the, there's, um, there's a timer on the physical machine that's running the, the FT virtual machine monitor. And the timer on the physical machine ticks and delivers an interrupt, a timer interrupt to the virtual machine monitor um, on the primary. The, the virtual machine monitor at you know, the appropriate moment um, uh, stops the execution of the primary, writes down the instruction number that it was at, you know, the instruction since boot, um, and then delivers, sort of fakes, emulates an interrupt into the guest operating system of the primary at that instruction number saying, oh, you know, your emulated timer hardware just ticked, here's the interrupt. And then the primary virtual machine monitor sends that instruction number, which the interrupt happened, you know, to the uh, backup. Um, the backup, of course, its virtual machine monitor is also taking timer interrupts from its physical timer, and it's not giving them, it's not giving its real physical timer interrupts to the, um, to the backup operating system, it's just, Ignoring them, um, when the log when the log entry for the primary's timer interrupt arrives here, then the backup virtual machine monitor will arrange with the CPU, and this requires special CPU um, support to um, cause the physical machine to interrupt at the same instruction number um, at the timer interrupt happening at the primary. At that point, the uh, virtual machine monitor gets control again from the guest and then fakes the timer interrupt um, into the backup operating system. Now exa at exactly the same instruction number as it occurred on the primary. Yeah? 
Well, yeah. So, so the observation is that this, this relies on the CPU having some special hardware in it where the VMM can tell the hardware, the CPU, please interrupt a thousand instructions from now. Right? And then the VMM, you know, where, so, so that, you know, it'll interrupt at the right instruction number, same instructions the primary did. And then the VMM just tells the CPU to start ex resume executing again in the backup. And exactly 1,000 instructions later, the CPU will force an interrupt into the virtual machine monitor. And that, that's special hardware, but it turns out it's you know, on all Intel chips. So it's not, it's not that special anymore. You know, 20, 15 years ago, it was exotic. Now it's totally normal. And it turns out there's a lot of other uses for it. Like um, if you want to do profiling, you want to do CPU time profiling, what you'd really like, or one way to do CPU time profiling, is to have the microprocessor interrupt every 1,000 instructions. Right? And this is the hardware that's, this hardware also, this is the same hardware that would cause the microprocessor to generate and interrupt every thousand instructions. So it's a very natural sort of gadget to want in your CPU. All right. Um, yes. Okay, so the question is, what if the backup gets ahead of the primary? So, you know, we standing above know that, oh, you know, the primary is about to take an interrupt at the millionth instruction. Um, but the backup has already, you know, executed the millionth and first instruction. So it's going to be if we let this happen, it's going to be too late to deliver the interrupt. If we, if we let the backup execute ahead of the primary, it's going to be too late to deliver the interrupt at the same point in the primary instruction stream and the backup instruction stream. So we cannot let that happen. We cannot let the backup get ahead of the primary in execution. Um, and the way VMware FT does that is that um, the, the, uh, the backup virtual machine monitor actually keeps a buffer of waiting events that have arrived from the primary. And it will not let the backup execute unless there's at least one event in that buffer. And if there's one event in that buffer, then it will know from the instruction number the place at which it's got to force um, the backup to stop executing. So always, always, the backup is executing with the CPU being told exactly where the next stopping point, the next instruction number of a stopping point is, because the backup only executes if it has a, an event here that tells it where to stop next. Um, so that means it starts up after the primary, because the backup can't even start executing until the primary has generated the first event, and that event has arrived at the backup. So the backup's sort of always one event basically behind the, at least one event behind the primary, and if it's slower for some other, whatever reason, maybe there's other stuff running on that physical machine, then the backup might get, you know, multiple events behind uh, the primary. All right. Um, there's a, one little piece of mess about arriving, for the specific case of arriving packets. Um, Ordinarily, um, when a packet arrives from a network interface card, if we weren't running a virtual machine, the network interface card would DMA the packet content into the memory of the computer that it's attached to sort of as the data arrives from the network interface card. Um, and that means, you know, you should never write software like this, but it could be that the operating system that's running on the computer might actually see the data of a packet as it's DMA'd or copied from the network interface card into memory, right? You know, this is, and you know, we don't know what operating, this system is designed so that it can support any operating system, and gosh, maybe there is an operating system that watches arriving packets in memory as they're copied into memory. Um, so we can't let that happen, because if the primary happens to be playing that trick, um, it's going to see, you know, if we allowed the network interface card to directly DMA incoming packets into the memory of the primary, 
the primary, you know, we don't have any control over the exact timing of when the network interface card copies data into memory. And so we're not gonna know sort of at what times the um, primary did or didn't observe uh, data from the packet arriving. And so what that means is that, in fact, the NIC um, copies incoming packets into private memory of the virtual machine monitor, um, and then the network interface card interrupts the virtual machine monitor and says, oh, a packet has arrived. At that point, the virtual machine monitor will suspend the primary, and remember what instruction number it suspended it at, copy the entire packet into the primary's memory while the primary is suspended and not looking at this copy, um, and then emulate a network interface card interrupt into the primary. Um, and then send the packet and the instruction number to the backup. Um, the backup will also suspend the backup, you know, virtual machine monitor will suspend the backup at that instruction number, copy the entire packet in again so the backup is guaranteed not to be watching the data arrive, and then fake and interrupt at the same instruction number as the primary. And this is the, um, the something, the bounce buffer mechanism explained in the paper. Okay, yeah, the, the, the only instructions that, uh, that result in logging channel traffic are, are weird instructions, which are rare. Um, no, it's instructions that might yield a different result if executed on the primary and backup, like instruction to get the current time of day or current processor number or ask how many instructions have been executed. Or, and, and those actually turn out to be relatively rare. There's also one to get random to ask on some machines to ask for a hardware-generated random number for cryptography or something. And, but those are not everyday instructions. Most instructions are like add instructions that are gonna get the same result on primary and backup. Uh, follow up to that. So if, if some like HTTP request comes into the primary, that the primary, well, the VNM is gonna interpret those as a stream of network packets, right? Yeah. So the way those get replicated on the backup is just by forwarding those network packets? That's exactly right. Each network packet just packaged up and forwarded as is, as a network packet, and is interpreted by the TCP IP stack on both, you know. So, so um, I'm expecting 99.99% you know, of the logging channel traffic to be incoming packets, and only a tiny fraction to be results from special non-deterministic instructions. Um, and so we can kind of guess what the traffic load is likely to be for a, for a server that serves clients, basically it's a copy of every client packet. Um, and then we'll sort of know what the logging channel, how fast the logging channel has to be. All right, so, um, so it's worth talking a little bit about how output works. Um, and in this system, really the only, what output basically means only is sending packets. So clients send requests in as network packets, the response goes back out as, a, as network packets and there's really no other form of output. Um, as I mentioned, the, you know, both primary and backup compute the output packet they want to send and that sort of ask the simulated NICs to send the packet is really sent on the primary and simply discard it, the output packet discarded on the backup. Um, okay, but it turns out it's a little more complicated than that. Um, so, Supposing we're, what we're uh, running is a, some sort of simple database server and the operation, the client operation that our database server uh, supports is increment. And the idea is the client sends an increment request, the uh, database server increments the value and sends back the new value. Um, so maybe on the primary, well let's say everything's fine so far and the primary and backup both have uh, value 10 in memory and that's the current value of the counter. Um, and some client on the local area network sends a, you know, an increment request to um, the primary. Uh, that packet is you know, delivered to the primary, it's, you know, it's executed, the primary, the sort of server software in the primary says, oh, you know, current value is 10, I'm gonna change it to 11 and send a you know, response packet back to the client saying, 
um, saying 11 as the reply. Uh, the same request is, as I mentioned, gonna, supposed to be sent to the backup. will also be processed here. It's going to change its 10 to 11 also, generate a reply, and we'll throw it away. So that's what's supposed to happen with output. However, um, you also need to ask yourself, what happens um, if there's a failure at an awkward time? Like you should always, in this class, you should always ask yourself, what's the most awkward time to have a failure, and what would happen if a failure occurred then? So, um, suppose the primary does indeed uh, generate the reply here back to the client, but the, client, the primary crashes just after sending the rep the, its reply to the client, and furthermore, and much worse, it turns out that, you know, this is just a network. It doesn't guarantee to deliver packets. Let's suppose this log entry on the login channel got dropped also. When the, uh, when the primary died. So now the state of play is the client received a reply saying 11, but the backup did not get the client request, so its state is still 10. Now, now the backup takes over because it sees the primary is dead, and this client or maybe some other client sends an increment request to the new backup, and now it's really processing these requests, and so the new backup, when it gets the next increment request, you know, it's now going to change its state to 11 and generate a second 11 response, maybe to the same client, maybe to a different client, which if the clients compare notes or if it's the same client, it's just obviously cannot have happened, right? And so, you know, because we have to support unmodified software that does not understand that there's any funny business of replication going on, that means we do not have the opportunity to, you know, you could imagine the client could, oh, you know, we could change the client to realize something funny had happened with the fault tolerance and do I don't know what, but we don't have that option here because this whole system really only makes sense if we're running unmodified software. So, um, so this was a big, this is a, a disaster. Um, we can't have let this happen. Does anybody remember from the paper how they prevent this from happening? The output rule. Yeah, so you want to, do you know the? Yes. Yeah, so the output rules is the, their solution to this problem. Um, and the idea is that the client is not allowed to generate, you know, and uh, generate any output. The primary is not allowed to generate any output, and what we're talking about now is this output here, until the backup acknowledges that it has received um, all log records up to this point. So the real sequence at the primary then, let's now un uncrash the primary. Um, go back to them starting at 10. The real sequence now with the output rule is that <clears throat> um, the input arrives. At the time the input arrives, that's when the virtual machine monitor um, sends a copy of the input to the backup. So the, the uh, sort of time at which this log message with the input is, is sent is, is before, strictly before the primary generates the output. Sort of obvious. Um, then after s firing this log entry off across the network, and now it's heading towards the backup, but you know, might have been lost, might not, um, the, pr the uh, Virtual machine monitor delivers a request to the primary server software. It generates the output. So now the, the uh, um, replicated, you know, the primary has actually generated, changed the state to 11 and generated a, an output packet that says 11. But the virtual machine monitor says, oh, wait a minute, we're not allowed to generate that output until all previous log records have been acknowledged by the backup. So, you know, this is the most recent previous log message. So this output is held by the virtual machine monitor until the, um, this log entry containing the input packet from the client is delivered to the virtual machine monitor and buffered by the virtual machine monitor, but though not necessarily executed. Right? Maybe just waiting for the backup to get to that point in the instruction stream. Um, and then the virtual machine monitor here will send an ACK packet back saying, yes, I did get that input. And when the acknowledgement comes back, um, only then will the virtual machine monitor here release the packet out onto the network. Um, and so the idea is that if the client could have seen the reply, 
then necessarily the backup must have seen the request and at least buffered it. Um, and so we no longer get this weird situation in which uh, a client can see a reply, but then there's a failure and a cutover, and the replica didn't know anything about that reply. Um, if the, you know, there's also the situation maybe this uh, message was lost, and if this log entry was lost, um, and then the primary crashes, well, since it hadn't been delivered, so the backup hadn't sent the act, that means if the primary crashed, it, you know, if this log entry was dropped and the primary crashed, it must have crashed before the virtual machine monitor released the output packet, and therefore this client couldn't have gotten the reply. And so it was not in a position to spot any irregularities. Everybody happy with the output rule? Yes. Like maintain the data structures and so on. I'm wondering uh, how low or high level the code in there is, and what language is usually implemented in. It's written in C. <laughs> no, I don't know. They don't. Uh, the paper doesn't mention how the virtual machine monitor is implemented. I mean, it's pretty low-level stuff because you know it's sitting there allocating memory and configuring page tables and talking to device drivers and intercepting instructions and understanding what instructions the guest was executing. So we're talking about low-level stuff. What language is written in, you know, traditionally C or C++, but I don't actually know. Okay, this of the primary has to delay at this point, waiting for the backup um, to say that it's up to date. This is a real performance thorn in the side of just about every replication scheme. This sort of synchronous wait where the, we can't let the primary get too far ahead of the backup because if the primary failed while it was ahead, that would, ex that would leave the backup lagging, lagging behind clients, right? So just about every replication system has this problem that at some point, the primary has to stall waiting for the backup. And it's a real limit on performance. Even if the machines are like side by side in adjacent racks, it's still, you know, we're talking about a half a millisecond or something to send messages back and forth with a primary is stalled. And if we want to like withstand earthquakes or citywide power failures, you know, the primary and the backup have to be in different cities, That's probably five milliseconds apart. So every time we produce output, if we replicate in the two replicas in a different city, every packet that it produces as output has to first wait the five milliseconds or whatever to have the last log entry get to the backup and have the acknowledgement come back and then we can release the pack packet. And you know, for, for, for sort of low intensity services, that's not a problem. Um, but if we're building a you know, database server that we would like to, you know, that if it weren't for this, could process millions of requests per second, then that's just unbelievably damaging for performance. Um, and this is a big reason why people, you know, you know if they possibly can, uh, use a replication scheme that's operating at a higher level and kind of understands the semantics of the operations and so it doesn't have to stall on every packet. You know, it could stall on every high level operation or even notice that, well, you know, read only operations don't have to stall at all. It's only writes that have to stall or something. But you have to, there has to be an application level replication scheme to, to realize that. You're absolutely right. So the observation is that you don't have to stall the execution of the primary. You only have to hold the output. Um, and so yeah, maybe that's not as bad as it could be. But nevertheless, it means that every, you know, in a service that could otherwise have responded in a couple of microseconds to the client, you know, if we have to first update the replica in the next city, we turned a you know a 10 microsecond interaction into a 10 millisecond interaction, possibly. If you have vast numbers of clients submitting concurrent requests, then you may, may be able to maintain high throughput even with high latency, but you have to be lucky to, uh, or, or a very clever designer to get that. Uh, why isn't it good enough to just log that you emitted an output, and then let's say that the primary did die uh, before the backup went live just to consume all the messages off the log? That's a great idea. But if you log in the memory of the primary, that log will disappear when the primary crashes. Or that's the usual semantics of a server failing, is that 
you, you lose everything inside the box, like the contents of memory. Or at least, you know, if, even if you didn't, if the failure is that somebody unplugged the power cable accidentally from the primary, you know, even if the primary just has battery backed up RAM or I don't know what, um, you can't get at it, right? The backup can't get at it. So in, in fact, this system does log the output and the place it logs it is in the memory of the backup. And in order to reliably log it there, you have to observe the output rule and wait for the acknowledgement. So it's an entirely correct idea, just can't use the primary's memory for it. Yes? Say it again. That's a clever idea. I, and so the question is, maybe input should go to the primary, but output should come from the backup. I, I completely haven't thought this through. That might work, but um, I, I don't know. That's interesting. Yeah, maybe that will work. Okay, um, one possibility this does expose though is that um, the situation, you know, maybe the primary crashes after its output is released. So the client does receive the reply, then the primary crashes. The backup's input is still in this event buffer in the virtual machine monitor um, of the backup, it hasn't been delivered to the actual replicated service. Um, when the backup goes live after the crash of the primary, the backup first has to consume all of the sort of log records that are lying around that it hasn't consumed yet, because it has to catch up to the primary, otherwise it won't take over with the same state. So before the backup can go live, it actually has to consume all these entries. The last entry is, presumably, is the um, request from the client. So the um, backup will be live after, after, it, uh, after the interrupt that delivers the request from the client. And that means that the um, backup will you know, increment its counter to 11 and then generate an output packet. And since it's live at this point, um, it will generate the output packet and the client will get two 11 replies. Um, which is also, if, it, if that really happened, would be um, anomalous, like possibly not something that could happen if there was only one server. The good news is that um, almost certainly, or the, almost certainly the client is talking to this service using TCP, and that this is the request and the response go back and forth on a TCP channel. The, when the backup takes over, the backup, since its state is identical to the primaries, it knows all about that TCP connection and what they're all the sequence numbers are and whatnot. Um, and when it generates this packet, it will generate it with the same TCP sequence number as the original packet. And the TCP stack on the client will say, oh, wait a minute, that's a duplicate packet. And we'll discard the duplicate packet at the TCP level. And the user level software will just never see this duplicate. Um, and so this system really, you know, you can view this as a kind of accidental or clever trick, but the fact is for any replication system where cutover can happen, which is to say pretty much any replication system, it's um, essentially impossible to design them in a way that they are guaranteed not to generate duplicate output. Um, basically, you know, well, you can err on either side of, of not, you can either not generate the output at all, which would be bad, which would be terrible, or you can generate the output twice on a cutover, um, but there's basically no way to generate it, be guaranteed to generate it only once. Everybody errors on the side of possibly generating duplicate output, um, and that means that at some level, you know, the client side of all replication schemes needs some sort of duplicate detection scheme. Here we get to use TCPs. If we didn't have TCP, there would have to be something else, maybe application level sequence numbers, or I don't know what. Um, and you'll see all of this, and actually you'll see versions of essentially everything I've talked about, like the output rule, for example, um, 
in labs two and three. You'll design your own replicated state machine. Yes? Um, yes to the first part. So the scenario is the um, primary sends a reply, and then either the primary sends a closed packet or the client closes the, connect, the TCP connection after it receives the primary's reply. So now there's like no connection on the client side. But there is a connection on the backup side. And so now the backup, so, so the backup consumes the very last log entry that has the input. It is now live. So we're not responsible for replicating anything at this point. Right, because the backup's now live. There's no other replica, because the primary died. So there's no, like if, if we don't, if the backup fails to execute in lockstep with the primary, that's fine actually, because the primary is, is dead and we do not want to execute in lockstep with it. Okay, so the primary is now not, it's live. It generates an output on this TCP connection that isn't closed yet from the backup's point of view. This packet arrives at the client on the TCP connection that doesn't exist anymore from the client's point of view. Like, no big whoopee on the client, right? It's just gonna throw away the packet as if nothing happened. The application won't know. The client may send a reset, something like a TCP error or whatever packet, um, back to the backup, and the backup does something or other with it. But it doesn't matter, because we're not diverging from anything, because there's no primary to diverge from. You can just handle a stray reset however it likes, and what it'll in fact do is basically ignore it. Um, but there's no, now that the backup has gone live, there's just no, we don't owe anybody anything as far as replication. Yeah? So in, in TCP, what determines the connection is like the source address, destination address of the ports for source and destination as well. So I'm wondering what, by which mechanism the backup can, can pretend to effectively be the primary for the client. Well, you can bet, since the backup's memory image is identical to the primary's image, that they're sending packets with the very same source TCP number and the very same everything. They're sending bit for bit identical packets. Um, Even though the, they might be representing servers with entirely different IP addresses? You know, at this level, the servers don't have IP addresses. Or, or for our purposes, the Virtual machines, you know, the primary and the backup virtual machines have IP addresses, but the, the physical computer and the VMM are transparent to the network. It's not entirely true, but it's basically the case that the virtual machine monitor and the physical machine don't really have an identity of their own on the network. Um, at least you can configure that, them that way. Instead, these the, you know, the virtual machine with its own operating system and its own TCP stack, it has an IP address and an Ethernet address and all this other stuff, which is identical between the primary and the backup. And when it sends a packet, it sends it with the virtual machine's IP address and Ethernet address. And those bits, um, at least in my mental model, are just simply passed through onto the local area network, which is exactly what we want. Right? And so they'll generate exactly the same packets that the primary would have generated. Um, there's maybe a little bit of trickery, you know, where the, the, we, if this, these are actually plugged into an Ethernet switch, into the physical machines may be plugged into different ports of an Ethernet switch, and we'd like the Ethernet switch to change its mind about which of these two machines it delivers packets with the replicated services Ethernet address. And so there's a little bit of funny business there. Um, for the most part, they're just generating identical packets, and we just send them out. Okay, so um, another little detail I've been glossing over is that I've been assuming that the primary just fails or the backup just fails. That it's fail stop, right? But that's not the only option. Another very common situation that has to be dealt with is if the two uh, machines are still up and running and executing, but there's something funny happened on the network. Um, that causes them not to be able to talk to each other, but to still be able to talk to some clients. So if that happened, if the primary and backup couldn't talk to each other, but they could still talk to clients, they would both think, oh, the other replica's dead. I better take over and go live. And so now we have 
two machines going live with this service, and now you know they're no longer sending each other log events or anything, they're just diverging. Maybe they're accepting different client inputs and changing their state in different ways. So now we have a split brain disaster if we let the primary and the backup go live because it was the network um, that has some kind of failure instead of these machines. Um, and the way that this paper solves it, I mean, is by appealing to an outside authority to make the decision about which of the primary or the backup is allowed to be live. Um, and so it, um, there, you know, it turns out that their storage is actually not on local disk. This almost doesn't matter. Um, but their storage is on some external disk server. And as well as being a disk server as a like, totally separate service that has nothing to do with disks, their disk server happens to export this test and set. Um, Uh, test and set service over the network where you, you can send a test and set request to it and there's some flag it's keeping in memory um, and it'll set the flag and return what the old value was. So both primary and backup have to um, sort of acquire this test and set flag. It's like a little bit like a lock in order to go live. They both maybe send test and set requests at the same time to this test and set server. The first one gets back a reply that says, oh, the flag used to be zero, now it's one. The second request to arrive, the response from the test and set server is, oh, actually the flag was already won when your request arrived. So, so basically you're not allowed to be primary. And so this, um, this test and set server, and we can think of it as a single machine, um, is the arbitrator that decides which of the two should go live if they both think the other one's dead um, due to a network partition. Any questions about this mechanism? You're busted. Um, yeah, the test and set server should be dead at the critical moment when, um, and, and so actually, even if there's not a network partition, under all circumstances in which one or the other of these wants to go live because it thinks the other's dead, even when the other one really is dead, um, the one that wants to go live still has to acquire the test and set lock. Because one of like the deep rules of, of the 6824 game is that um, you cannot tell whether another computer is dead or not. All you know is that you stopped receiving packets from it. And you don't know whether it's because the other computer is dead or because um, that something has gone wrong with the network between you and the other computer. So all the backup sees is, well, I've stopped getting packets. Maybe the primary is dead, maybe it's alive. Um, primary probably sees the same thing. Um, so if there's a network partition, they certainly have to ask the test and set server. But since they don't know if it's a network partition, they have to ask the test and set server regardless of whether it's a partition or not. So anytime either of them wants to go live, the test and set server also has to be alive because they always have to acquire this test and set lock. Um, so the test and set server sounds like a single point of failure. Right? We're trying to build a replicated fault tolerant whatever thing, um, but in the end, you know, we can't fail over unless, the, unless this is alive. So um, that's a bit of a bummer. I'm guessing though, I'm making a strong guess that the test and set server is actually itself a replicated service and is fault tolerant, right? Because almost certainly, I mean, these people at VMware, they're like happy to sell you a million dollar highly available storage system that uses enormous amounts of replication internally. Um, since the test and set thing is on their disk server, I'm, I'm guessing it's replicated too. Um, and the stuff you'll be doing in lab two and lab three is more than powerful enough for you to build your own uh, fault tolerant test and set server. So this problem can easily be eliminated. <laughs>